Hello, folks. Ken Rashad, HBCU Sports. Achieving racial equity in college sports is a report by the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. The report and its recommendations were produced by the Knight Commission's Task Force on Racial, Equal on racial Equity, uh, which began its work in the aftermath of, the George, of George Floyd's death. My special guests are the chairman and co-vice chair people of the report. Uh, I am joined uh, by esteemed guest, uh, my esteemed guest, Lynn Elmore, who is an attorney and senior lecturer in sports management at Columbia University. Uh, Shantiana Keys, who serves as manager of education at the Women's Basketball Coaches Association. And Jock McClendon, director of football affairs for the Los Angeles Rams, my favorite team, go Rams. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much for taking a few minutes to meet with me and to talk about this report. Uh, needless to say, the report addresses several social and socioeconomic conditions that many of our student athletes face, uh, uh, student athletes face uh, at, at our colleges and universities nationwide. But needless to say, the, the, the points that stood out to us the most uh, in this particular space were those uh, points addressing HBCUs. And, and Mr. Elmore, I will begin with you. Uh, in the report, it notes that 70% of black students who attend HBCUs come from low income families, uh, many from secondary education systems where they have been in, inadequately prepared for college. How can member institutions in the NCAA help student athletes overcome these challenges? Well, I mean, we recognize obviously that um, HBCUs have a different mission than uh, predominantly white institutions. The numbers that you just mentioned uh, essentially established barriers to a quality education without help and, and resources. And, and we focus this report on athletics. And, and there are a number of recommendations that uh, we have certainly made to uh, you know, essentially try to address uh, those areas and, and try to allow the NCAA and member institutions, uh, the college football playoff to, to address closing educational opportunity gaps, uh, which exist uh, between uh, black college athletes in regardless of institution and their white counterparts. We also want to hold institutions accountable in recruitment and hiring because that has an impact on uh, the vision of college, college athletes. Uh, we want uh, those the institutions to invest in programs that support and enhance black athletes college experience and promote inclusion and belonging uh, on those campuses. Uh, in, in, some, in some ways, HBCUs are a model in that regard. And finally, we want to create more equitable opportunities for black athletes to assume leadership roles, uh, particularly in adv advocacy and governance. And that pertains primarily to uh, predominantly white institutions, although uh, HBCUs aren't immune. And, and Ms. Keyes, I'm, I'm guessing in your position, uh, an issue like this might even create even more of a challenge given the fact that there may be some uh, gender equity issues associated with those challenges as well. Would you agree or would that be overstating it? No, I don't think it's overstating. Um, I, I think, you know, we have an equity issue overall, right? Right now we're seeing a lot of the gender equity issues in women's basketball uh, following the tournament, um, the NCAA tournament uh, back in March. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that, you know, that they're, uh, exclusive or that we can't address some of the same issues at the um, same time with some of the same policy. Um, but, you know, given, given our report, we did focus primarily, obviously, on race. Uh, um, Jock, uh, what, what are your views on the issue with respect to uh, student athletes uh, in HBCUs and the, I, I guess, the challenges that they have with, with respect to you know, coming from low income families, H how does that carry over uh, in, in your particular area in, in, in the pro ranks? So, you know what, I'll say this as somebody who uh, attended a PWI who comes from a low income uh, family, single mother household. Um, one thing that I can't complain about my experience about college was resources and um, to really shift the uh, economics is to me one of the, the, the main things that need to happen in this case. Right. Uh, HBCUs. Uh, serve such key constituents of this country. And, you know, when we talk about uh, equity and equality, it really starts with resources. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we wanted to break down with our report is being able to provide uh, mechanisms and levers that could be pulled uh, to, you know, shift these dynamics. And I think that, um, you know, when we get to a place to where 
we're doing that as a country and we're listening to the black voice, we're listening to the black student athlete, male and female, and providing resources for success. Uh, that's where we start to see the, the 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 pendulum swinging in the right direction. So, you know, those are some of the things that we wanted to be able to uh, present, and also, you know, being able to chance to amplify the voice, amplify to be listened, given the the platform and visibility to be heard. So, um, you know, super excited about the report and really just want to carry on this momentum because, uh, you know, I think Lynn has always said as he's led our team, right, is that uh, we've heard a lot of action, um, but it's time to turn uh, this action into policies and reforms that are concrete so that we can actually be able to move forward. So uh, appreciate Lynn's leadership, appreciate Shantiana and all she's done um, as we move forward together, but super excited about, uh, you know, these, these, these steps forward. Chuck, you talk Ken, about- if I, if I could, Ken, sure, if I could, sure. just to add something. Look, I, back in 2003, born out of a Knight Commission recommendation to attach uh, academics to postseason play. You know, the weight of penalties uh, for not meeting the academic progress rate, which is a metric that, uh, that, that measures what I just spoke of, you know, the weight of failure has fallen on HBCUs. You know, they account for 72% of the violations of APRs, uh, not meeting the academic performance rate, even though they're just 7% of Division I. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are underfunded in uh, trying to meet that, that special, um, that special the job that they certainly have, that special mission that they have. And I think it's very important for us to recognize that more resources need to be poured in based on that, that, that particular and different mission that HBCUs have in order to bring um, the, the student athletes uh, on their campuses to a point where we can start closing those gaps and, and that they can make postseason tournaments more frequently and not have to bear that burden. Yeah, you, you mentioned that, and that was another glaring statistic with, with that report. 7% of, uh, of, of, of HBCUs are, uh, comprise of D1 schools, 7%. But, but 72% of all APR postseason penalties are distributed primarily with HBCUs. Is is there, I, I guess, obviously, I'm, I'm guessing the key word is obviously funding here, but is there a particular reason why they're disproportionately punished more than compared to other in institutions that are supposedly limited resource institutions? Is there any particular reason for that? And, and anyone, feel free to chime in on that. Well, I'll say this, it, uh, there's no, um, exact reason other than the fact that uh, the, the athletes on, on these particular, in these particular schools just haven't been able to meet the, the metric necessary uh, for a team to, to be able to, to reach that number uh, that, that allows them to be uh, eligible. And, and one of the biggest reasons is because they don't have the same resources uh, to continue to help the athletes beyond just becoming quality athletes to become quality students and, and to maintain uh, the, the, the numbers necessary to be eligible. There is the accelerating uh, academic uh, progress program uh, provided funding for low resource uh, institutions uh, to help them meet APR standards, but it's woefully underfunded uh, from the standpoint of HBCUs. Only about a million dollars per school uh, is, is awarded and that's not nearly enough to provide the programs necessary that a lot of the predominantly white institutions are able to provide to help their athletes become eligible. So we certainly need the NCAA to boost support through the AASP, uh, to boost support through that type of funding uh, that helps with more robust academic uh, support and the additional resources and maybe even more time to comply with APR standards that, that allow them to be equal to the predominantly white institutions would certainly help. Right. Back in December, uh, there were actually a, a, a group of HBCU athletes who uh, filed a lawsuit on the grounds that the uneven APR punishments that hurt them both, hurt them both athletically and in the pursuit of professional sports opportunities. Is there any likelihood that the NCAA might hold itself or that anyone can hold, the, hold them accountable for the practices in this particular area? Or is it just kind of pie in the sky? Anyone feel free to, to chime in? <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a big question right there. Uh, I, I would say this, though. I think we live in a world now to where, you know, we talk about this, uh, this mythical talk of equality. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get there one day. But we live in a world to where th there's such disparities between different communities, different cultures, different universities that we got to talk about equity. 
Um, we treat we we need to treat everybody fairly, not the same. And uh, this, these HBCU institutions need more resources poured into them to be able to provide the necessary, um, you know, mechanisms and, and abilities for their student athletes to overcome some things they have to overcome. And uh, this this truly starts with um, the ability the ability to tra to transform some of these. Uh, some of these resources. And I think that once we get to a place to where that can happen, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to find, um, you know, much more transformative success uh, because it is be it is different being a black student athlete. And it is different being a black student athlete at an HBCU. And I think that we got to continue to say that we can't treat them the same as a lot of the other institutions. They, they need more. One day we'll be at that mythical place of equality. But right now, this thing's about equity. And the equity is very, uh, very much in a place to where it's 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 not an even scale. It's not eye to eye. And, um, you know, for us to sit here and um, examine things like they are is, is, is shame. It's shame on the people examining, not shame on the people that are looking for help. So we need to continue to um, strive forward, strive forward together. But, you know, we, we need to be able to treat everybody fairly, not the same. And uh, to, to shift those economics, to shift those resources would be a great start in the right direction. Ms. Keys, you'd like to chime in? Yeah, no, no, I agree with Jacques. I mean, uh, when we spoke to the HBCU presidents that we did, we, that we consulted about this report, um, they mentioned, you know, the amount of time to reach maybe a level of equity or fairness. Um, and, and when you're looking at systemic issues, I mean, at the end of the day, to Jacques's point, you know, it's it's about being fair and it's about being equitable. We're not all starting at the same place. So when you're talking about HBCU that has a mission um, serving, you know, 40% um, uh, of the students there being um, not only low income, but, you know, the first graduates or college students in their in their homes. I mean, we have to realize we're, we're not on the same playing field. So why are we playing by the same standards, in my opinion? Um, so to Jock's point, yes, the resources need to be poured in, but there has to be a reasonable amount of time for HBCUs to be able to catch and meet those standards. It's not a two year, five year. Um, um, Lane, correct me. I know that there was a short amount of time that schools were given um, when this started, but um, I can't recall the number. But for what, whatever that time period was, I mean, you can't overcome the systemic issue. I mean, we're seeing it every day, overcome those systemic issues in such a short span of time. Yeah, we need to return to a two year period to give schools a chance to, to reach those metrics, given the boost in support. Uh, you know, one example is, and we heard that from, uh, you know, the, the commissioner of the MEAC, from the faculty athletic representative from Norfolk State and, and athletic director at Bethune-Cookman. Um, you know, we heard that one of the deficits in the funding had to do with academic support, that they couldn't get uh, enough academic support people uh, based on the amount of budget that they particularly had. Uh, because of, of the low resources as compared to the, the PWIs, predominantly white institutions. And that, in many ways, accounts for the gap. But you ask the question, will people listen and, and will they hearken this clarion call? Uh, the bottom line is that's why we're here. Our, our job with this report is to generate uh, not only the discussion, but also to be able to you know, maybe foment some outrage as to recognizing that there is uh, an adverse impact on black athletes in general, and particularly on HBCU athletes. And finally, you know, with the moral suasion that we can, um, we can gather with the ability to bring people together to discuss this more deeply, I, I think that ultimately you will see some movement. As I said, we did this as a Knight Commission back in 2003, uh, made a discussion uh, more policy to change um, the the postseason uh, uh, the postseason uh, eligibility rules to institute a, a connection to academic performance, which heretofore hadn't been the case, and now we have it. Now we've got to make that uh, particular policy uh, more fair. The w with respect to APR. The report, and I, I thought this was key, it proposes that the NCAA suspend APR penalties for two years to re-examine the process. Right. I think we know how this might benefit HBCUs, but I guess, and I, I don't want to necessarily say, is it needed, but is it? I mean, it, it, to re-examine the process to what degree? Because there's there are some that say, why is this particular uh, APR process even necessary for, for not only HBCUs, but just college athletics in general? 
Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at this one. I think that, um, you know, one of the things we've seen with uh, when you talk about these coaching contracts is the mechanisms of the APR and what that will do to bonuses in their contracts, right? So, you know, we talk about in our report a lot about clustering and, you know, wh what can we do to make that process, the journey of the student athlete more uh, meaningful, transformative, and being able to open that open that log of uh, opportunities uh, through through education. And, you know, APR becomes an obstacle because institutions have vetted interest in what that APR is because there are performance, uh, there are uh, bonuses and things tied to them. So, you know, I, I think that how, how can we make it more equitable? Let's let's remove that barrier to entry to, uh, you know, for, for student athletes, black student athletes to be able to have all those um, diverse opportunities in their educational experience. So, um, you know, I do think this is something that could one, you know, bring more equity to the space as we've already talked about that give HBCUs the chance to be able to, um, you know, evaluate and become a more equitable process, but also that um, it should hopefully open the floodgates that student athletes will be able to maybe even p p uh, pick some particular majors that they weren't able to in the past. On a much yeah, broader, let's, go ahead, go ahead, give me, I was going to say, that. just take a look at it. The academic progress rate is is a metric that accounts for eligibility and retention of, of athletes for each academic term, which essentially translates into, are they on pace to graduate? Okay. And that's essentially what it comes down to. Right. And, and certainly it, it has merit, but it doesn't have as much merit when uh, the factors that go into the retention and, and remaining eligible aren't equal. And that's what we're trying to do, level the playing field so that when judge, HBCU uh, institution, as well as PWI, those predominantly white institutions are all measured equally. Right now, that's not the case. On a much broader scale, the report talks about PWIs not necessarily being equipped to nurture uh, black students particularly as it, as it relates to adjusting to a college life and so forth. Uh, does that strengthen the argument that HBCUs are a better fit for black students? Or is it just a case where these PWIs just simply aren't doing enough? And I guess, at, 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 I mean, what does that look like? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Ms. Keys, yeah. Yeah, so, um I too, like Jacques, attended a PWI. Um, in particular, am I frozen? I'm no, sorry. Yeah, you're, you're, you're good. Uh, okay. Um, I went to a PWI, uh, in particularly uh, the antebellum capital of Georgia, uh, is where I went to school. So, uh, you know, the belonging there is already a unique experience for sure. Um, I do think HBCUs, and I think research shows um, that, you know, we have cited um, in this report. Um, shows that black student athletes are more well adjusted and they, they are not overcoming that obstacle of trying to belong in the space, um, which allows them um, to have an advantage in the classroom already. And it doesn't, you don't have that obstacle in your development transition into college. Um, so we try to address some of those things in terms of making the student athlete experience better um, on, these, on these PWI campuses. Um, whether that be having cultural competency training for their coaches um, or, you know, funding a summer bridge program that can help that transition um, from their high school. So um, I absolutely HBCUs are better equipped in that area for sure. Okay. A couple more questions uh, and one with respect to the, 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 the playing field. Um, the NCAA obviously has a lot of pool and, and, and a lot of money, obviously. Uh, it, and can obviously put it policy in place to, to level the playing field for HBCUs. But at what point does a lot of the responsibility fall upon, say, the states in which many of these HBCUs, those that are publicly funded, what role do those state governments or state legislatures have to, uh, and the role that they play have with respect to helping to level the playing field, uh, either at the state or even at the federal level? Uh, Mr. Elmore. Well, I, I would just say that it, it, it's obvious that uh, from a funding standpoint, uh, when you're taking a look at schools within particular states, that you know there has to be equity in the funding if, in fact, the, the schools, when you recognize their missions, are to achieve those missions. And in any state that ignores um, uh, the, the needs of, of institutions, regardless, 
uh, of whether they're predominantly white institutions or HBCUs, recognizing their mission is, is failing. And so, yeah, absolutely, there is a responsibility of state legislatures to fund schools to the extent that certainly they can, but more than anything else, to the extent that they need uh, to be able to achieve their mission. And, and finally, with all of these recommendations in place, based upon your interactions with uh, some of the individuals who helped contribute to this report, and, and just based upon your overall uh uh, back and forth with the NCA, how receptive have they been to these recommendations? Or, or, or what, or what level of? Re- <laughs> I see you smirk. How how receptive do you think they might be to these changes? I know it's not going to happen overnight, but what how how receptive or what do you suspect the 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 uh, response will be given the recommendations now that they're out? Well, I think the three of us uh, have differing opinions, of course. Uh, but as the uh, as the one who's had the most experience on on the night commission, as well as interacting with the NCAA in that regard, I would say that um, you know they will listen. Uh, and not only the NCAA, but we also have the college football playoff, and people have to recognize that uh, the two, from a funding standpoint, are different. The NCAA doesn't have any uh, authority over how that money is distributed. Almost five hundred million dollars uh, per year, so they need to be brought in. To the picture as well, considering the problems that for college football, Division One football has with regard to uh, minority hiring and and the reliance on uh, on black athletes. Uh, but in 2003, as I mentioned before, born out of a Knight Commission uh, recommendation that you know academics uh, be part of the determination with regard to who's eligible for postseason. I, I think that that they will certainly listen because it makes sense. Um, I think that. Uh, the public will take a look at this and understand the reason and the rationale behind it. And, and again, we're at a moment of, of racial reckoning as well as reconciliation, and we recognize that the systemic racism has to stop, and the recommendations that we made are, are a pathway towards ending it. 